As we reach the edge of the solar system, I feel a bit like Halley must have felt, as he and the crew of the Paramore paused at the mouth of the River Thames before catching the wind and setting forth into first the North Sea and then the deep waters of the North Atlantic to head south into the vast expanse of a mostly uncharted ocean with the mission of taking data and establishing locations in order to aid in navigation. For over a year, we have journeyed from the caves of France, where we examined the carvings of phases of the moon on a fragment of bone, to the pyramids of Egypt. We've examined planetary conjunctions and oracle bones in the Yellow River Valley of China, and journeyed across the vast expanse of Mesopotamia and read some of the earliest written records of the movements of the objects in the heavens. In that time, we've taken care to note those motions, and we have peered over the shoulders of the first classical Greek philosophers, and then later the thinkers of the Hellenistic world, as they built beautifully elegant mathematical models to account for them. We've survived plagues and invasions to reach not just one, but two reflowerings of thought, first in the Islamic world and then in Europe. We saw, too, the beginnings of revolutions and reformations that gave rise to new ideas of the cosmos and new conflicts, both cultural and intellectual, that intertwined at times. And in all of this, we found the creation of a new and powerful way of looking at the natural world, brought forth from the seeds planted decades, centuries, and even millennia earlier. With this new method of inquiry, scholars and investigators began to probe nature and acquire evidence to support first these newer models of the workings of the universe at large, and then entire new scientific disciplines. Methods were expanded, and observations improved until the heavens became a place just like the earth, made of the same stuff and subject to the same natural laws. And so we learned our true place within a solar system, a collection of worlds orbiting the sun, which itself came to be understood as a star in a vast collection of other stars, and perhaps other things. As we reach this transition, one part of our exploration is mostly complete. We have come to the edge of the shallower waters of a continental shelf, and now we stand poised at the edge of a vast abyss, a great emptiness filled here and there with outposts of light and energy blazing forth into an eternal night. And so, at this moment, we pause to consider where we have been and what the work of the astronomers of the millennia have given us. We consult their logbooks and ready ourselves for a journey that seeks to place us within a much wider expanse and understand more fully the great ocean of space in which we are but a tiny island outpost. This week, we look back on what we know about the stars from the astronomers before we take up the tools of the astrophysicists and venture into those deeper waters. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place, Episode 31, To the Stars. Well, here we are. After all this time, we have reached the edge of our solar system. In our last episode, we got to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, and we considered one final time the definition of a planet. Maybe you liked my idea. Maybe you think I'm a bit crazy. One person commented on Facebook that the podcast episode should have been a lot shorter. Something like, Pluto equals planet, the end. And I'm okay with that. Perhaps it's the historian in me, maybe it's the fact that my work was in galactic dynamics, but I tend to take the long view and the big picture view on this whole thing. 
Others, though, have different perspectives. What's important is that all are welcome to join in the adventure of inquiry. So where does that leave us? It brings us to a point of transition. While the acceptance of Newton's laws of motion and gravitation led to an evolution of thought on the nature of the world circling the sun, that sparked a great deal of work on what might now be called orbital dynamics and planetary science. There was also an understanding that beyond finding new worlds, there was sort of a closure to what had been a 150 year long debate. The Earth was a world, and it orbited the Sun, and all of the theological and philosophical proclaiming wasn't going to change the clear evidence that condemned any other view to the margins of history. Even as direct observational evidence remained elusive, the explanatory power of Newtonian mechanics made all of those counterarguments seem just a bit ridiculous. As this was taking place, however, there was another question that was beginning to make its way to the forefront of those who accepted the scientific consensus. If the Earth was a world orbiting the Sun, how far away were the stars? How big was this new universe that Copernicus had first suggested and that Newton had sort of fleshed out? No one more completely encapsulated this shift of emphasis than the amateur turned professional William Herschel. He discovered Uranus and doubled the size of the solar system while gathering data to help more experienced astronomers look for the stellar parallax that would provide the definitive evidence for an Earth's motion and give an estimate of just how far away the stars were. So, before we begin to explore the story of starlight and what it reveals to us, let's take an episode to examine just how humanity's understanding of the scale of the universe changed from the time of Copernicus until Frederick Bessel definitively measured the shift of a star known as 61 Cygni. And, as an aside, I think there is one other thing we should note here that is of some importance. As I have read a number of sources for this episode, many of the authors and commentators make a point that it is during this period that astronomy ends as a separate discipline from physics and becomes subsumed into it as sort of a subdiscipline. While there is certainly some truth in this perspective, I find it to be an awfully imperial claim. Something, by the way, physics is often known for. In my view, there are still a number of good scientists doing what can clearly be identified as astronomy, most notably those scientists associated with the European Space Agency's Gaia mission. What has changed is what sorts of things astronomy might apply to and how. So before we look back, let me see if I can sort of break this down just a little bit. If you will recall, Prior to the period broadly associated with the scientific revolution, there was a real divide between astronomy and physics. It began when first Hipparchus and then Ptolemy rejected some of Aristotle's basic physical assumptions about the motions of things in the heavens and on the earth, and it continued through to the period of Galileo. Physicists were natural philosophers who attempted to, to explain the motions of things both on the earth and in the celestial realms via various causes. Astronomers, on the other hand, attempted to characterize the motions of the heavens and the objects contained within them through the dual programs of observation and mathematical modeling. As such, for much of the history of the West, it was the astronomers who were the great mathematicians, while the physicists were much closer to the philosophers in that they speculated about the nature of reality. However, beginning with men like Galileo and Kepler, these distinctions began to change. Some physicists became more focused on characterizing natural laws and less concerned with attempting to explain the causes for those laws. Added to this was a clear progression to understanding that these natural laws were best expressed in mathematical form in order to allow for the use of deductive demonstration in working out possible physical consequences that could then be tested. Astronomers, on the other hand, were, at the same time, caught in that debate as to what the correct model should be and what should be used to predict the future motions of the heavenly bodies. This led to a greater emphasis on precise observation in order to provide the necessary evidence to support one model over the other. 
As observational methods and technology improved, so did both the accuracy and scope of those observations. With the triumph of Newton's physics, the two were, in a moment, brought together before, once again, their paths diverged somewhat. And it is here that we must understand what separates astronomy and physics in the period afterwards. A difference, I would suggest, remains today. In Newton's synthesis, the baton of mathematically modeling physical systems was passed to the physicists and the physical mathematicians or mathematical physicists or whatever you want to call that hybrid. In the work of men like Laplace and Lagrange, mathematical frameworks were constructed based on physical principles rooted in Newton's concepts of space and time, mass and momentum, work and impulse. In astronomy, the task, so prominently seen in the work of Herschel, became the gathering of data about the positions and motions of things beyond the orbit of the moon. Vast mountains of data were gathered on the motions of the worlds orbiting the sun and on the positions of the stars. This great work would provide much of the data the physicists would use to verify and modify their models and hypotheses in the years going forward. This work continues even today. As I write this, astronomers are gathering together to discuss their work based on the data being gathered by the Gaia satellite. This data on the positions of literally billions of objects is being used to constrain and inform the various models of the Sun's position and motion through the Milky Way galaxy, the shape and dynamics of our home galaxy, and its broad motion through an even larger universe as it interacts with other vast collections of stars. And this is just a small sampling of the work astronomers all over the world are doing with the data being collected with technologies such as this. As such, I think it is proper to say that while physics and astronomy are certainly connected, and there are aspects of what was once astronomy that have been taken into the broader paradigm in research programs usually associated with physics, astronomy remains a very healthy and very separate scientific discipline with its own unique lines of inquiry, and investigation. With these preliminaries out of the way, let's take a look at the question of how far away the stars are. If you will recall, the pre-Copernican models, beginning with Ptolemy, through the work of the Islamic Hakim to the medieval astronomers like Regio Monte, had a celestial sphere upon which all of the stars were fixed. Therefore, the question of how far the stars were away was really a question of how far this ultimate sphere was from the Earth at the center of the cosmos. Ptolemy's full model, put forth in his Tetrabiblios, had this celestial sphere begin just outside the maximum extent of Saturn's epicycle. This distance was calculated through the use of both the timing of certain planetary events, such as the arrival of, say, Jupiter at a point in its motion known as quadrature, and the measurement of the size of the Earth. But it was expressed in terms of a ratio of something like the diameter of the Earth or the distance from the Earth to the Moon. In this case, and with all of the various approximations that followed that were based on the same basic model, it was assumed that the stars weren't all that far away at least in terms of the distance we've come to understand now. Unfortunately, the Tetrabiblios did not survive into the period of medieval Europe, though astronomers and scholars in the Islamic world likely knew of it, at least until the Mongol invasions of the 13th and 14th centuries. As such, it was left to the emerging scholastic community to reconstruct the Ptolemaic model from the Almagest, along with the writings of Aristotle a combination that led to an unwieldy hybrid of systems that created spheres of some substantial thickness. While most scholars assume that the outermost celestial sphere was mostly, as both Aristotle and Ptolemy had said, in that it was a sort of hard, definite outer boundary of the universe, there were those who were willing to entertain the idea that, like the planetary spheres, it had a thickness that was great enough to allow for some variation in the distances of the stars. With the publication of Copernicus's Revolution of the Spheres, the estimation of the distance to the stars changed pretty dramatically. 
First, the scale of the solar system was reworked as ratios of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, again using astronomical data and the fundamentals of geometry. This increased the size of the solar system somewhat. However, due to the lack of observation of stellar parallax, it was necessary to move the celestial sphere much, much farther away from the center of the universe, now occupied by the Sun. Just how far this was, was unclear as the lack of observable parallax only set an inner limit to where that sphere would be. The other question was whether all of the stars were still to be considered as being the same distance away from the Sun. It seems that Copernicus was somewhat unclear about his thoughts on this, but what is true is that he allowed for the possibility of a sphere of finite thickness beyond which there were no stars. This would be the position Kepler would take in his writings. As we know, Tycho would reject Copernicus's model and offer his own geocentric version instead, and from what I've been able to determine, he too placed the celestial sphere just outside the orbit of Saturn. So. Where did this idea of a distribution of stars that was spread out through this vast space actually take place? The two earliest writers to really advance the ideas were an Englishman by the name of Thomas Diggs and the Frenchman living in Holland, René Descartes. Diggs, who lived in the years between 1546 and 1595, is a really fascinating figure who our narrative is sort of just passed by, but was instrumental in establishing Copernicus's ideas in England. In his writings, Diggs went one step further in proposing that the stars were spread out over a vast expanse, stretching away from the sun, and thus he discarded that outermost celestial sphere entirely. As near as I've been able to find, he's probably the first person to have actually done that. Now, there are two consequences to this sort of arrangement that proved to be of some lasting note. The first was a question of if there were innumerable stars stretching out over some great distance, how was the sky ever dark? While this would become to be known in time as Olber's paradox, it is, in fact, something that originates with Diggs. And we'll return to this in due time in this episode. The second issue Diggs models raises is a more theological one. When we imagine the place to which the souls of the departed travel after death, we, and when I say we here, I mean we as a species, we tend to think of them ascending upwards into the sky and eventually into the heavens. As I hope the episodes I did on ancient astronomical traditions showed, this is a fairly universal belief among ancient peoples, and it continued in many religions as they developed into the sorts of systems we recognize today. In Christianity, as it acquired much of the intellectual and philosophical traditions of the Greco-Roman world, it was thought by most that the ultimate destination of those departed souls, granted that they were faithful to the tenets of the religion, was beyond the long-held celestial sphere of the permanently fixed stars. When Diggs removes the sphere, the question arises as to where these souls will go, and thus where heaven is located. For Diggs, the answer seemed to be that heaven was residing among those innumerable stars so very far away. But for many, this spiritual and material world combining was simply unacceptable. As a result, as the idea of a celestial sphere lost credibility, there would have to be a new accommodation made that moved heaven and the realm of God completely out of the physical plane. While such an interpretation is so commonplace now that it seems odd to think otherwise, the transition from heaven and hell being physical places to something else has a history that is over a century long in the West. While Digg's work was generally limited to a British audience, as he published in the end of an almanac of sorts, Descartes' work was much more influential. Read by almost every learned figure in Europe, even if, at times, such reading was done in secret, Descartes' assertion that the celestial sphere was no more was based on his philosophical ideas as much as any physical proof. If Tycho and Kepler had done away with crystalline spheres for the planets, why would such a thing still exist for the stars? And if it didn't exist, then what would keep the stars from being scattered at different distances from the center of the universe, which, in Descartes' writings, at least those he wrote for himself and his close friends, was occupied by the sun?
After Descartes' death, his writings supporting the heliocentric model of the solar system were more widely distributed, and so were influential on both Christian Huygens and Isaac Newton. Huygens is another one of those figures who our narrative more or less took his past without giving us time to stop, and like Diggs, his life probably deserves a supplemental episode of its own. For those who are interested, one of the episodes of the first Cosmos season has Carl Sagan spending some time on the intellectual life of Holland, and Huygens figures prominently in that. So, when Descartes really puts the idea out there that stars are both a long ways away and spread out in terms of their distance from the sun, the question arises about whether we can tell just how far away. Huygens tries to answer this question in a rather ingenious method. Among the vast number of things he was known for, Huygens was, in his time, one of the premier opticians of his day. In this, he not only constructed some of the best telescopes, but he developed a full wave theory of light that stood in contrast to those of both Hooke and the corpuscular argument that Newton was making. As a part of this, he was able to show that the brightness of a light source would diminish as the inverse of the square of the distance an observer was from the source. In other words, if an observer doubled their distance from a light source, it would appear that the source would be one quarter as bright. If the observer was 10 times further away, the light would be 100 times dimmer. So far, so good. Next, he assumed that any star being observed in the sky was physically identical to the sun, and thus gave off the same amount of light. Now clearly, as we now know, this is a mistaken assumption. But given what anyone knew at the time, it was as good as any and it allowed him to move forward in his argument. Thus, if a star was dimmer in the sky, it would be so because it was farther away. What Huygens then did was take a screen and make a series of small holes in that screen, with each hole being smaller than the previous one. He then held that screen up to the sun and he looked at how bright the light that passed through each of the holes was and then tried to compare that to the brightness of the stars. By comparing the size of the hole to the size of the sun's disk, he could then estimate the amount of light being received from the star compared to the amount of light being received from the sun and calculate a rough distance to the star. His program star for this estimate was the brightest star visible in the northern hemisphere, Sirius just east of the constellation of Orion in what is known as Canis Major. Using this method, he calculated in 1698 that Sirius was some 27,664 astronomical units from the Earth, or about 2,700 times further away from the Sun than Saturn is. While Huygens was working on this, Newton was also attempting to make an estimate, using a proposal put forth by the Scottish mathematician James Gregory. Gregory had published in 1668 that a similar exercise could be done by more directly comparing Sirius to a planet whose brightness changed over the course of the year. The best candidate for this is Jupiter, and so the method allowed for the comparison to be made in real time by looking at the planet and then looking at the star and then looking at the planet all in the same night rather than having to approximate over successive nights between night and day as Huygens' method required. Using this approach, Newton came up with a number of about one million astronomical units, something he shared only with a very close circle of friends. Of course, the difficulty with both of these measurements is that they make a number of assumptions. First, of course, is the one related to the stars all being just like the sun. The second was that there was no intervening material between the stars and the observer on the Earth that would block out some of the light that that observer received. The third assumption was that the observer's sensitivity to observing brightness was in fact linear. As each of these would eventually be shown to be incorrect, what is seen is that there would be no substitute to measuring stellar parallax directly. The issue, though, was that if the numbers being calculated were even close to being accurate, it was clear that any sort of parallax angle would be very, very small, maybe as small or even smaller than a second of arc. Given the technical difficulties associated with the refraction or bending of light by the atmosphere, 
the warping of instruments by changes in humidity and temperature, and the aberration caused by the glass of the various lenses used in telescopes, this was going to be a hard thing to do. Robert Hooke, however, came up with what is a really novel solution to at least the first of these problems. When he noticed that the star Gamma Draconis passed very nearly overhead through the zenith of his location in London. This meant that the light from the star would be unaffected by atmospheric refraction. To combat the effects of weather, he built a zenith pointing telescope into the structure of his house. That's really amazing if you think about it. I'm just going to have my house modified to build a telescope that points straight up, which he did, by the way, along his chimney, if I understand the, the sources correctly. Finally, he made the focal length of the objective lens very long, with the le total length of the telescope spanning all three stories of his house, thus reducing the amount of aberration caused by the objective lens and increasing the magnification in order to detect even a very small shift. It really was a remarkable telescope built to observe one single star at just one short interval of time for the single purpose of detecting parallax. And yet, for all of that effort, Hook made just four observations before illness and an accident with the objective lens brought the project to a halt. Nevertheless, he did claim to observe the phenomenon, though his data did little to convince his colleagues of the accuracy of his claim. What is probably more important about this episode is that it did show that such a project was feasible. And so, in 1720, a wealthy English amateur astronomer by the name of Samuel Molyneux decided to give it another try. Commissioning the construction of an instrument from the leading telescope manufacturer in London at the time, one George Graham, Molyneux invited James Bradley to join him in his attempts. What the two men found was that the position of Gamma Draconis did, in fact, change over the course of six months. But that its position changed in a way that was opposite to what should have been expected had the shift been due to stellar parallax. The two men would debate a variety of reasons and even commission a second instrument before Bradley hit upon the explanation we previously discussed. The aberration of starlight or the shift in a star's position due to the fact that the Earth is moving in its orbit with respect to the incoming light. This measurement was, of course, the first definitive observational evidence that the Earth not only moved, but did so in a fashion consistent with it orbiting the Sun. It also showed that all measurements, even those recently published from Flamsteed's catalog, would have to be adjusted slightly for the Earth's motion. With this taken into account, any additional motion of Gamma Draconis was ruled out, which meant given the accuracy of the instrument being used, that the star had to be at least 400,000 astronomical units away. With the posthumous publication of Newton's System of the World occurring at about the same time, that containing the long-hidden 1 million astronomical unit estimation, it was becoming more and more clear that the stars were vastly further away than anyone had dared to imagine. It would be during this time that Edmund Halley would report the first observations of the proper motion of stars. As we mentioned in our biographical episodes on the Londoner, this was direct observational proof that stars were not permanently affixed to some sphere and was more or less the death knell of that idea even for the most die-hard proponents. It would be William Herschel who would next do work in this area by building on the idea that Galileo had had to observe double stars in hopes that any errors introduced by either the atmosphere or the telescope would affect both stars at the same time. And so any differences in the angle between the stars that were measured would actually be due to their observed motions. The difficulty with this was that it had been shown that a large percentage of these double stars were likely due to the stars actually being in physical proximity to each other rather than just lying along a given line of sight with one of the stars being much farther away than the other. Nevertheless, Herschel, bringing the tools of natural history to bear, cataloged over 1,000 of these doubles in hopes that they might be one day of use. It would be William's son, John, 
who would use these double stars to show that, in fact, these stars that were close to each other could orbit each other and did so in elliptical orbits, thus proving the universality of Newton's laws of motion and his formulation of gravity. The path to observing parallax turned out, though, to follow Halley's proper motion observations. As time went on and the proper adjustments for the Earth's motion could be made, astronomers finally could compare the positions of stars in the heavens over time with Flamsteed's catalog. As this was done, the proper motion of a number of stars was measured, and soon there emerged a consensus about that motion. If you were to observe two runners traveling at right angles to your line of sight across a field, for example, the runner closer to you would seem to cover a larger visual arc than the one that was farther away, even if they were both traveling at the same speed. Since this idea applies to stars observed from the Earth just as well as it does to runners, it was thought that the stars with the largest proper motion would be most likely to be close. In the early 19th century, Giuseppe Piazzi, the man who would discover Ceres, and Frederick Bessel found that the fairly faint star, 61 Cygni, was traveling across the sky at a remarkable rate of five arc seconds a year. This, however, created a contradiction. Since the star was dim, the assumption that all stars were like the sun meant that it should be further away. However, its large proper motion argued that it was, in fact, close at hand. This left observers with a bit of a paradox concerning how to proceed. In 1837, the German astronomer Wilhelm Struve set out three criteria for selecting stars to attempt to observe stellar parallax for. First, the star he thought had to be bright. Second, it had to have a large proper motion. Third, if it were part of a double system, the two stars had to be separated by a relatively large distance relative to any orbital period that might be observed. Now, Struve actually possessed a pretty remarkable refracting telescope designed by a man we'll discuss in greater detail when we get to a examination of light and spectra, a man by the name of Joseph Fraunhofer. The objective lens of this telescope was about 10 inches of diameter, which was huge for the time, and the mount was what was known as an equatorial, meaning that the axis around which the telescope tube rotated pointed at the North Star thus making tracking objects across the sky very simple and accurate compared to other systems such as those that had been used by Herschel. Struve poured through the data on the stars and selected Vega in the constellation of Lyra as his candidate, as it was very bright and had a relatively large proper motion compared to a lot of other stars. His first observing run produced 17 good observations, and from them, he calculated a parallax for Vega of about one-eighth of a second of arc. This, though, seemed to be a bit much for most other astronomers to accept given the large number of false claims that had made previously. And so, about three years later, as he continued to make observations, Struver would publish another 100 observations that gave a number that was about twice as big as its previous thing. At the same time, Frederick Bessel was also trying to pin down a parallax measurement at his observatory in Königsberg. He had decided that the assumption of brightness as an indicator of distance was inaccurate, and so he focused on 61 Cygni with its large proper motion. His instruments had also been made by Fraunhofer, but it wasn't as large. Instead, it employed a novel technology that the lens had been split in half and then set so that the two semicircular pieces could be moved parallel to each other. This meant that each half of the lens could produce an independent image that would have been half as bright had just one lens be used, been used. This was particularly useful for observing doubles, which 61 Cygni was, as the lenses could be positioned so that the image produced by one half of the lens of one star of the double could be lined up to coincide with the image produced by the second half of the lens of the second star in the double. That's a little confusing, I know. By examining the shift, though, between these two halves of the lenses, a very accurate measurement of the angle between the two stars of the double could be made. 
Bessel put this to use with 61 Cygni and made as many as 16 observations of the star a night over the course of a full year. When the data was plotted, it matched the expected theoretical shape of the position curve for the star exactly with the parallax shift of one-third of a second of arc. While a case may be made that Struve discovered parallax first with a small sample size observation of Vega, it was Bessel's extraordinarily meticulous use of Fraunhofer's brilliant technological design that carried the day, and it is generally accepted that Bessel is the man who, in 1838, first added a measured third dimension to the stellar distribution. For those who are curious, the 61 Cygni's distance from the Sun is about 700,000 astronomical units, or 11.2 light years. For Vega, the distance is 1.6 million astronomical units, or 25.2 light years. As we will see, these stars lie well within our solar neighborhood, and the distances to many others will prove to be even more mind-boggling. By the end of the 19th century, parallax measurements had been made for about 60 stars due to the labor-intensive nature of accumulating data with the naked eye. With the advent of astrophotography, this process was made a good bit easier, and so larger numbers of its stars could be examined. To give a sense of the difficulty in making these measurements, the closest star to the Earth, Proxima Centauri, is about 4.2 light years away which corresponds to a parallax shift of around three quarters of an arc second, or the equivalent of absorbing the width of a U.S. nickel, a coin of about one inch in diameter, from a distance of three and a half miles, or about 5.3 kilometers. Given these small angles and the distortion introduced by the movement of the Earth's atmosphere, Ground-based telescopes can, in the best conditions, make measurements of stellar parallax for stars that are no farther away than about 325 light years. Space-based telescopes, such as the Hipparchus mission, launched in 1989, and the Hubble Wide Field Camera 3, have increased this substantially. Hipparchus was able to measure out to about 1,600 light years, while the Hubble could measure to 10,000 light years if the observed star was particularly bright. One of the primary missions of the Gaia spacecraft is to extend this distance to tens of thousands of light years. As we will see in future episodes, this ability to directly measure the distance to a number of stars will be vitally important in a number of different ways. As soon as the earliest estimates of the distances to the stars were made by men like Huygens, the question arose as to the nature of the distribution of the stars. If they weren't contained or attached to some big sphere, how were they spread out through space? Galileo's observation that the Milky Way consisted of innumerable individual stars across a band of the sky called into the question any sort of spherical distribution though this didn't stop Newton from suggesting just such a thing when asked by a minister friend of his. Newton, you see, was caught on the horns of a dilemma. His universal law of gravitation seemed to imply that if the distribution of stars weren't both exactly symmetrical and infinite, the stars would be pulled towards each other and eventually clumped together. Yet, the observed distribution strongly suggested that the universe lacks such symmetry. As a result, Newton put forth the idea that it was God's providence that nudged the stars back into their stable places when required. It was, to say, one of Newton's more ad hoc arguments, one destined to be shown as absurd with, Newt with Halley's observation of proper motion. Another question put to Newton, one we have already alluded to, was posed by the physician William Stuckley. Stuckley had suggested that based on Galileo's observations that the distribution of stars would actually be something of a two-part arrangement. One part would consist of very bright stars arranged in a spherically symmetric distribution around the Sun. Surrounding this would be a second grouping of a much larger number of very dim stars organized in a ring much like what Huygens had recently observed with Saturn. Unknown to Stuckley, 
Newton had secretly switched over to a similar model. And so when Stuckley and Halley met Newton for breakfast in 1721, the three men likely discussed the model in some detail, leading Halley to present it to the Royal Society in a paper just a few days later. Stuckley's question in all of this was, what would the luminosity of the distribution of spherical stars be if that sphere was allowed to be either very large or infinitely large and contain a mostly uniform distribution of stars? In his very rough calculations, he had come to the conclusion that the quote-unquote nighttime sky would be lit with a, the light of an infinite number of suns and thus there would actually be no darkness. While Halley did attempt to make an argument against this, it contained a few flaws and so was rejected. It was not until 1744 that a Swiss astronomer, J.P.L. de Chasseau, would work out both the math and the solution to the paradox it presented. Chasseau was able to show mathematically that if the light from an infinite distribution of stars was not absorbed or diminished in some way, the sky would be uniformly luminous and there would be no night. However, if even the most minute part of that light was absorbed, this proof was invalidated and darkness again returned. This argument was repeated by Olbers in 1823, and it is from his derivations and solutions that we get the term Olbers' paradox, though, as we can see, neither Chisseau nor Olbers saw it as such, and it should rightly be called either Stuckley's or even Diggs' paradox. In 1734, amateur astronomer Thomas Wright of Durham put forth a model, model that said all of the stars were contained in a vast, large shell that was centered on the divine center of the universe where God dwelled. And what I want you to think about is this shell, it isn't something like you've got the sun at the middle and the solar system and the shells outside of that. The sun and all of the things that we see actually reside within the thickness of this shell. The band of the Milky Way, he said, was a result of looking from the sun along the shell while regions of lower stellar density were due to looking either towards or away from the divine center and thus at right angles to the shell. In this attempt to restore heaven to a physical place in the cosmos, one is nearly required to view the pictures that accompany his hypothesis. And so, if you're curious, we'll try to post a few at the podcast website, thescientificodyssey.typebad.com. The philosopher Immanuel Kant would adapt this model to have the universe as sort of a ring around that divine center rather than being a shell. Herschel would be the one who would take up the first truly scientific attempt to determine the distribution of stars by doing star counts as described in an earlier episode. Unfortunately, these ep efforts were hampered by the same issues that plagued the attempts to determine stellar distances, and so, while he did rightly deduce a disc-shaped collection of stars for the galaxy, he mistakenly arrived at the conclusion that the Sun was at the center of that distribution. More accurate models would have to wait until the development of two technologies involving light, spectroscopy and photography, that would unlock a more accurate picture of the Milky Way and our place within it. And so, finally, we have arrived at the end of our review of those who have gone before us. What they have given us is that stars are separated by enormous distances in the ex expanse of space. Their distribution suggests the disk, and the motion implies that both they and the sun are moving within that disk. Thus, we are now ready to embark on the second part of our voyage, this time into the realm of astrophysics and the mysteries the light from these distant stars and nebulae reveal. In our next episode, we'll look at the line of inquiry, first started by Newton's investigations of light, and see that they lead us across the Atlantic Ocean to an observatory built on the grounds of a university first dedicated to the training of ministers in Reformed theology. Until then, full sails on your journey.